Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, yes. thank you for bringing us through for another night. Yes. Father, we are glad to be back into your house yes. of worship one more time, Father. Yes. Thank you for your son that died on the cross for our sins. Yes. We come to you just as we are this morning. We bow our heads and humble hearts, Father. Yes. As we approach your throne of prayer, we are asking you for your forgiveness, O oh, Father. Yes. If we have sinned against you in any kind of way, Father, yes. offended anyone in any kind of way, Father, please forgive us, Father. Yes. Thank you, Father, Holy Spirit, you see. Thank you for giving us guidance, direction, and protection, Father. Yes. Keeping us on the straight and narrow path. Lord, we need your help. Yes. We cannot make this journey alone. Amen. Thank you for helping us up the rough side of the mountain, Lord. Yes. Thank you for being a leading post for us, Lord. Yes. We can lean on you. We cannot lean on anybody else. Yes. Strengthen us, Father, where we are weak. Yes. Fill us up where we are torn down, Father. Amen. Touch God, direct us in a way that you would have us to go, Father. Yes. Bless the bereaved this morning, Father. Yes, yes. Comfort them in their hour of need, Father. Yes, Strengthen them, Lord, individually, one by one, Father. Yes. Touch, guide, direct them in a way that you would have them to go, Father. Yes, Bless the sick and the shut-ins, Father, yes. including myself, Father. Yes. Bless our family, Father, yes. church family, yes. our community, yes. our nation. Yes. If anyone needs medication, we pray to the to the Lord to give the doctors and the nurses the wisdom and the knowledge to give us the right medication, Father. Amen. So we will return back to a portion of our health, Father. Amen. Thank you for our transportation. Amen. Thank you for all the good times as well as the bad times, Thank Lord, you. Father. Thanks. You have brought us a mighty long ways, Father. Yes. Through hurt, harm, or danger. Thank you, Thank you for everything you have provided for us, Father. Amen. Reach down with your healing hands and your loving care. Touch each and every one here today, Father. Amen. From the pulpit to the back pew, Father. Yes. Thank you for the sunshine, Lord, and thank you for your rain, Father. Thank you, Father. Thanking you for bringing us out of the darkness into the daylight, thank Father. You, Father. Thanking you for being a man fixer, Lord, and a heartbreak of Amen. Amen. We surrender our all in all to you, Father. Yes. You can do more with us, Father, than we can. You have all power in your hands, Father. Mm -hmm. We give you all the glory, the praises, yes. and the honor, Father. Thank you, Father. We know that you are the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Yes. You are our source. Yes. Without you, Lord, we cannot do anything at all. Yes. Thank you for lying down last night, oh Father. Thank you for the man your mercy watched over us last night Amen. while we slumbered and slept, Father. Thank you you Father. touched us with a thing of love this morning. Open our eyes, roll up in our souls, and put your hand in our hands this morning. Start us out on another day's journey, Father. Amen. We all have a mission to complete, Father. Lord, it's all about you, not Amen. about me, Father. Amen. We have to please God, don't please anyone else. Amen. Can't nobody else save you but Jesus. In yes, all these blessings we pray in Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Number three. When my doubts and fears bring me big of tears through my mind.
correct. 563. Yeah. Song of encouragement. Down in my soul, Christ holy. Oh, oh, oh. Sit down in my soul, cries holy. Get a fellowship meeting. 
How do they view you after they see you viewing them? So we talk about people who have never came in. And as soon as they look, you know the first thing you do when you go to a new place is a military thing. You scout there, you recon, you make sure. And you know where the exits are? I'm just letting you know I ain't always been a Christian. So when I went to certain nighttime establishments, I need to know was it a, what you call a juke joint where there was only one way in, one way out. But there was always a second way out. I just need to know where it was. So when people come to church, by natural, you find out where everything is, and then you look at the people. And the question is, when they walk in, when they look at you, do they see the back of your head, or do they see you turning around looking at them? And then when they see you looking at them, how are they viewing you after they view you viewing them? What kind of look do you get? Just something to think about. So the title is to say, when someone comes to the assembly on Sunday, Wednesday night, uh, when they assess you, your smile or lack of smile, when they see you looking them up and down, you know, you can look at somebody up and down and be like, yeah. Or you can look at somebody like up and down and be like, notice the same look, but it's the attitude because your face will tell on you when your mouth won't say a word. Mm -hmm. So it's because, I mean, I'm just thinking, I have been to a congregation where the preacher, because he didn't know who it was, I told him, when I go places, I'll never tell people about it. And he gave me this look, like, what do you want? And I saw him looking up and down. Now, the old Robert, the thing is, I done been saved a little bit more. So what I wanted to say, and what I, I mean, I actually went through my mind, I had to ask God to forgive me because I thought about cussing him out in his own church, in his foyer, oh, in front of everybody. Yeah, <laughs> because sometimes we have to be honest with ourselves and say, how would you feel mm -hmm. if someone walks in and they look at you like, look, yeah. mm -hmm. nobody likes that feeling. And I'm thinking, now, I'm getting honest, I ain't the finest brother in the world, but when I dress, I dress on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I know I didn't look flamboyant, everything was just, come on, I'll say, well, how's he looking at me this way? Mm -hmm. And I said I was never going to go back to that congregation ever again. No, I now, I actually ended up having to go back because one of the ladies that I knew was an older lady, and she ended up in the nursing home. So when I would go out of town, I would go see her. And I told her that time, she said, baby, you're going to go back one of these days. I said, no, man, mama, she passed away. And I ended up going back to that place only because of the funeral. Now, that's not a testament to say that we had that problem here, but I need you to understand. <coughs> the feeling that people get when you walk in, well, I'm say, when they walk in, how do you make them feel when they come in? Because it's important. This woman knew when she walked in this Pharisee religious man house, she had to pass by folk who you guarantee would look like, because uh, remember, she was a sinner. Mm -hmm. They knew what she did. Somebody always trying to figure out what her job was. It doesn't say. You worried about the wrong thing. Don't worry about what her job was. They just said she was a sinner. Every last one of us who's walked through these doors have always been in that position, haven't you? Everybody has been a sinner. Mm -hmm. yes. And there's some folk who know your past. Mm -hmm. And when they see you, what do they do? Because mm -hmm. I'm telling you, I've been in a homecoming somewhere, and somebody came in, and I'm sitting again, you know, I sit in the back. And I heard somebody say, why are they here? And I'm thinking, okay, a good question. <laughs> we ain't seen them on, and I'm thinking, now you're telling me this person is a member, or has a straight away. But they're here now. All I'm thinking is you're just like the big brother and the other little brother who went away and lost all his money and came back. And you're mad because they came back. Remember, you don't have a heaven and hell to put somebody in. This ain't your church. This is Christ's church. And Christ wants everybody who's left to come back. So just we need to be mindful that sometimes you're going to go places and people by their unconscious Mindset, they're going to um, show their attitude or let their speech or their body language or their uh, behavior towards someone either make somebody want to leave the church that they at or feel welcome by what they see. So, and I use this to say that remember, Jesus was considered a guest and uh, the woman was considered a, a visitor. Uh, the guest meaning someone who has been personally invited to a home or to a gathering where they take part in the function or we take part of the, you missed our Bible study this morning, um, the pastor and his wife was invited to a particular party. 
They didn't, they, they, they didn't re decline it, they just didn't go. And so happened, there was a reason why the Lord didn't want them to go. But either way it go, if you invite it, hey, it's a party. So if I say, I'm having a birthday party, and I invite everybody except Jimmy, then if everybody comes, everybody's invited, but if Jimmy shows up, guess what he is? He's a visitor because I did not invite him. Now, for whatever reason, I invite him, but invite his wife, but not him. Yeah, I, that's kind of low down. I'm, I'm better now. I wish you said I can't be low down like that. I just won't invite nobody. So that way I won't miss nobody. But the point is to say, the visitor, by definition, is a person who is an uninvited person who comes into a place or a gathering and is considered a uh, foreigner or a stranger versus a guest is someone who's considered a companion, a friend, or family. So when you invite somebody, you, you expected them to come in like family. So, But if somebody shows up at your party that ain't supposed to be there, you ain't too happy about them being there. So when a person comes to our worship uh, who's not a member or, uh, matter of fact, let's take it even further. A person who is a member someplace else, but they comes here, how do you treat them? Because you know there's some people who always visit from other places. Matter of fact, I was at Adam Street this morning and I saw one of my church members over there at 830 service. I was like, okay, that's all right. Then as I was driving over here, I said, wait a minute. You can be there at the 830 service, but you come in late at 11 o'clock at our service. Move right along. <laughs> I'm just telling you, you know how my mind works. And I was like, you always say, okay, anyway. We know here as members of the Church of Christ and many Church of Christ, other places, that's an open invitation to everyone to come worship with us and hear the word of God every time the doors of the church building are open. But I guess my question is, I wrote this down, have you ever stopped and considered whether or not you treat them, you personally treat them as a guest or do you treat them as a visitor? By your facial expressions, your body language, do you make them feel embarrassed? Do you make them feel ignored, unwanted, and uh, uncomfortable? Because nobody wants to be in a place where you feel uncomfortable. You feel like I'm out of place and I really don't want, I don't want to be here because they don't want me here. So therefore you feel humiliated like this one. Or do you make a person feel calm? Uh, when they come in, they, you just, they, they get greeted with a smile. And just like, because you have to remember there's some people who believe the church building is going to fall if they step into a church building. For everything they've done, they expect lightning and thunder to come down if they walk into a church building. So do we make them feel calm? Do we recognize a visitor when they come in and we just let them sit in and we don't say nothing to them? Do you make them feel comfort? Welcome, that's what I'm thinking of. And honor to be our guest. So we remind you that people already have a preconceived attitude and an expectation of godly behavior among Christians when they walk into the Lord's house. Am I right? Amen. When you came, you and your wife came the first time, did you have an expectation of what you should expect when you step into the Lord's house, right? So if we showed our table and act like you get, uh, oh, we'll say we walk around like our uh, Bible movements don't stand and treated you differently, would that make you want to come back again? And that's how we have to understand that sometimes, subconsciously, we treat people that way because we don't know them. We treat people this way based on certain criteria or religious thoughts that we have already in our mind. So if we understand this, that people expect a particular behavior, a God behavior to come in, guess who also expects a God of behavior when folks come in? God does. God expects you to treat <laughs> His people and other people who may be trying to get to Jesus in a such a way, because remember now, that some people who can't get to Jesus because you and your funky attitude is in the way. So in other words, if that's how Christians act, I'm doing better than you all, so I don't need Jesus, because if that's how Jesus will act, then I don't need to fool with him. And believe me, I'm trying to tell you, I've had that thought in my mind. I'm not telling you something that I'm guessing. I had that in my mind. Wait a minute, this is how y'all act. Then I don't need it. I'm going to find with Jesus the way I'm doing. It. So we have to be mindful that all it takes is one person to show their tail. They believe everybody that way shows their tail. So how do they view you after they view you viewing them? 
So today, this is part three, and we're going to deal mostly with, uh, well, let me say it this way, because uh, Miss Gibson's here, Debbie, the nurse lady, said something. That's what I'm calling you out because you said something. So I figured, you know what, she's right, but I'm going to make sure we understand it. It's technically the idea of someone being a guest and being a visitor, and again, it's not necessarily anything wrong with it. But we know that technically everyone that comes to visit that was not personally invited to worship, theoretically, is what? A visitor. Now we know that there's an open invitation because that's what the church is supposed to do. But let's be politically correct. If I invite you, I don't know who you are. Who you are. Hey, how you doing? You know how some people be like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah, just, just know that's just how folks get because they want to know who you are. But technically they're visitors. She's right. So it's important to understand that they're considered a stranger and an outsider. They're not in the family because we don't know who you are. But regardless of the reason that the person comes, once they come into the house of the Lord, they ought to be treated as a guest. Because I'm, I've said before, for those who didn't know, I came to visit here the first time because I found out this where the honeys were. I've said it before, I sat third row to the back. If I ever go visit, I was like, if y'all ever notice when y'all go to be visit, I always sit on the right hand side, second or third row to the back. It's a mental thing for me, I don't know why. But I didn't come for the right reasons. But guess what, I still came to the Lord's house. So if we understand that, you're still supposed to be treated as a guest. And we are host here at Southside. And we're supposed to show and greet every person the same. Whether or not, or whether it's their ethnicity, you know, I don't like to believe the word race because there's only one race, which is the human race. But whether or not your color, there's some lighter folk that are lighter than some, there's some darker folk that are darker than some. But our ethnicity, or our culture, our gender, economic status, their religious belief, or most importantly, their outward appearance. Remember last week I dealt with, we used to think uh, a woman's uh, dress is too high because you can see the thigh. Uh, uh, your boy's breeches are too low, so he got to go. Because that's what we believe. But remember, you can't put what belongs to Christians on folk who are not Christians. Don't put your religious belief on someone who don't even believe the same way you do. I used to believe that people didn't wear hats on their head. There's something wrong with them. Because, you know, I grew up women wore them hats. We had the mother bowl. You didn't have no mother bow. We're trying to figure out why every woman ain't wearing white. First day of the week, brother's supposed to wear all black, women's supposed to wear all white. You have some. That was some religious traditions that I couldn't understand. Why y'all ain't doing this? And why y'all doing it every week? You ain't supposed to do the Lord's Supper but once every six months. Or the first of the month. So that was a mindset, but I can't put that. So I can't bind what I believe a woman should be wearing or what a brother should be wearing. Because you remember at one time, I know right here, you didn't wear a tie, you couldn't serve. I was messing with Sister Ida. That was a time when Sister Ida didn't see me. Because she wearing pants. Y'all act like I ain't don't want to know about it. Y'all know how you see those things more kids. But the point is to say, we have to be mindful not to put our religious judgment on folk that the Bible ain't saying. So that's important. So in other words, when people come in, we got to show them hospitality. Well, what I say, what the Bible calls hospitality. Why do I say that? The New Testament definition um, of the word hospitality, even though it's found in the Old Testament, it's still the same. It's the love of strangers. So we're supposed to love or show love to strangers. So the definition, it, it carries the idea of the quality or disposition of receiving or treating strangers as guests with a warm, friendly, and generous attitude. When he first came, I didn't know he was that, that baby's that woman's child. Katie's baby, Katie's baby boy. Didn't know. Didn't care. First thing I did was greet him, like, hey, how you doing? The cat that comes from Atlanta that drives a motorcycle. Yeah, what's his name? You know what I'm talking about. Comes all the way from Atlanta, comes Cortez. here. Cortez. I treated him the same way. So it's like we have to treat people exactly the same way. Regardless of how we know them or what we don't know them. Man. You should treat them with love because you never know. I'm going to get too far ahead, but I'm going to put it this way. Someone might be saying, okay, okay, I understand that, that it's, well, a good idea would be to, what I've seen in other churches is, create or um, 
have a welcoming crew. Um, what do you call those other things? Greeters. Or some folks that you designate in the church to welcome our guests. Now, the reason why I, I kind of like the, the idea, but that's, I got two responses to that because um, first is I'm kind of partial to the idea because having a welcome crew of greeters is good because we know everybody in the church ain't the friendliest people in the church. Okay, I'm glad I got an amen because if not, I was going to walk down there and start pointing at somebody. <laughs> that's me. But it's just to say, we know that everybody in the church ain't got the sweetest smile when folk walk in. You look at them and you're like, how you doing that? I don't know how I'm going to make it. <laughs> Ooh, no. Okay. I, I, didn't mean to call, I didn't call your name my dick, sister. Sister Rice, I'm looking at it. I have to do it wrong. Because she had some rice yesterday that she cooked for the funeral. And she ain't eating none. That's all I'm saying. Um, but I know I'm going to sleep this afternoon because I didn't eat it either. I figured if the woman made the rice, won't eat the rice, then I better not eat the rice <laughs> But it's just to say that some people in the church that are not the most friendly people in the church. They come because this is what they're supposed to do. They don't really care about love you or not. And that thing about those people, you kind of just avoid. You, you have to hug them and you have to shake their hands so you do. But the problem is that is that some folk in the church, when you show up, they make you feel at home. Am I right? Mm -hmm. But you know the flip side of that, that there's some folk who in the church, uh, when you show up, uh, they make you feel like you wish you were still at home. Mm -hmm. Somebody missed that. Okay. That's just some folk that you just don't want to see. Because they're going to make you feel miserable because they're miserable. But then there's some people that could be hurt. That young man right there, I know we hurt. But he still has a smile on his face. He's still praying like, you know what? God is still good. So you can't help but have a joyful attitude when you see him. All I want to do is make sure his mustache right. Because as a man, the mustache ain't right, he ain't feeling right. So think about it. You see a man in this club, like, this mustache be tight. Like that day LaPont came here with a beard all the way through. I was like, what's wrong? Is he okay? I said, man, he ain't feel good. Not but when you fellowship with one another, you see the small things. You see what I'm saying? So you know one another. So when someone comes in, you know, you know what? Because of the relationship I have with you, I may need to encourage you. So all I'm talking about is understand that this is not just individually. Yes, it is. That's just some folk in the church that we need to understand that from the pulpit to the last few are just some people that just ain't the most friendly people in the world. All That's right. just the youngest. Right. Yeah. Everybody in here, by the fact, who's met one preacher mm -hmm. and one person in the church that you just know good and well, they just ain't friendly. Mm -hmm. They don't have a pleasing disposition. They don't seem to smile a lot. Matter of fact, when you see them, they got this look on their face like they're constipated. All right now. Yeah. And you, you, and you know what I'm talking about. And it's a preacher sometimes. And then it's you like you preachers. Well, that's a preacher that I just don't want to fool with. And if some of us, if you've been to some of those uh, homecomings and you hear how some of these preachers talk, and you say, "Wait, hey, man, I'm proud. Matter of fact, I need a perfect example of somebody that's just always joyful. John Jenkins from uh, uh, what's his what's the name of the church? Spring Hill. Spring Hill Church Christ. Church Christ. Church Christ. Yes. He makes you when we come. Make sure y'all got to a good place. Make sure they got extra chicken. I said, wait a minute. Yeah, I don't go along this. We may have to sit in the back, but he makes sure that he still treats us right. And when you go there, you feel like you're at home. Folk that got up like they see, they ain't got to get up. He's like, yeah, brother, you're preaching. I'm like, no, I want to sit up here anyway. Let me go to the other side. But they make you feel like you're at home. So, but there's some people that just make you feel like I should have just stayed at home. Now you get what I'm saying. The second response to having greeters is, even though I like the idea, I don't really particularly like the idea. What are you talking about, Robert? Because when you have a designated group or a group of greeters or people that you decide to set up for the greeters, that gives the impression to the other members that they don't have to show hospitality. Y'all didn't think about that. It's not my job to greet folk. That's their job to greet folk. It's not my job to show some hospitality. It's their job to so hospitality. Amen. And then here's the problem. They're just, it's like I'm shucking what God told me to do because the church can set up folk to do that for me. 
I'm here today to tell you that it's everybody's job who's in the yeah. church to show yeah. hospitality. Now we know, because somebody had told me, well, it's not my job, and you have to understand this when they told me that. And they gave me scriptures, which is what? First Timothy, third chapter, verse number two, and Titus 1 8, where the Bible says it's the, uh, the elders, the bishop, and the pastors that are supposed to be this. That's an attribute, that's a virtue that they're supposed to have. So if, if it's, it's only supposed to be for those people who have that position. So then I asked them a quick question. I was being slick. Y'all know not just being slick anyway. So I said, so okay then, so you're saying it's their job. I said, that means I ain't got to show you hospitality today. Oh, oh you the preacher. I said, no, you just gave me a scripture. Oh. It don't say the preacher, isn't it? Supposed to show you hospitality. Yeah. See how sometimes what your, your religious tradition make you think, but you ain't taking totality. You know, I'm going to joke because I'm going to make you pay for it if you try to be slick. So they believe that being hospitality is only for the elders. If you ain't got elders and deacons, then you need to do this. But here's the thing. Hospitality is a command by God to all his people and not just a few select people. What you got to understand is he's saying it's the elder, the bishop, and the thing, they must be already displaying the attribute of hospitality. Yeah. Not, I'm going to be an elder, let me start being hospitable. If you ain't hospitable before, you ain't going to be hospitable now. So it's saying that this is something that everyone should be having. So God gave a command of hospitality to all his people. As a matter of fact, after God delivered his people out of the land of Egypt, Leviticus is first, is that the first book or the second book, third book? Leviticus 19. He, after that, he says, Leviticus 19, 33 through 34. If a stranger dwells in your land, you shall not mistreat him. The stranger who dwells among you shall be as you as one born among you. Supposed to treat him like family. And you shall love him like you do yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord of your God. So which means the command of showing hospitality to strangers and foreigners is to all his people. He said treat them like family. So when someone comes in, treat them like family. That's why I said sometimes it's a bad thing that I treat you like family because I'm going to mistreat you. Just like I do everybody else outside. Uh, bless his heart. So he already found out I'm crazy. He might have guessed it in the first, but now he knows for sure. So on the way home, you think you're all right? <laughs> That's what I would say. But the command is to understand that everyone's supposed to be a hospital. So be hospital. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with greeters. I'm not saying anything wrong with workers. That's make sure you don't get out there and tell them. Robert said, that's wrong to see. That's not what I'm saying. That's a good idea. But it's everybody's job to be hospitable and not just a select few. Because, how do we say this? People might have had a long week. If they see one or two people smile, it's like duck, 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 goose. A few people smiling, one person looking like this. Uh-uh, you, you done messed up my day. I got three right. smiles and then your face turned up. No. All right. Everybody <laughs> should have the attitude that, you know what, I'm glad to see you. Glad you came in. Uh, let me know if there's anything I do for you. And I would say, don't tell people that. <laughs> if you ain't going to do nothing. That's right. Well, let me know if there's anything we can do for you. Suppose they tell you, can I get some water? Well, you can walk down there to go past that second door. No, because I've seen people do it. I can tell you where I was. I was like, wait a minute, you? No, you told them where to go get water. They're visiting instead of you going to get it yourself. I was done, so I went and got the water. And I, you know how I am. I'm low down. I'm walking in there, pulling the water all up like this. He go go the visit. You like to open it up? Uh huh. Okay. You now was that low down? Yes. But I want to show something to them. Don't say you're going to do something. Oh, let me do something for you. And then when they ask you to do it, you don't want to do it. So the question comes down to, how do people view you when they view you viewing them when they come in? How do we treat folk? And the beauty of that is, oh, I'm almost talking, but I'm going to tell it in just a minute. Someone may say that's Old Testament, which Leviticus is Old Testament. Is there a New Testament scripture that gives us a command that tells us that we are supposed to still show hospitality? Glad you asked. Hebrews 13, chapter verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 13, chapter verses 1 and 2. See, this is what happened to get a new Bible. The pages stick and don't act right. There we go. 
I'm trying to look cute with this thin Bible, but it ain't worth the run. Anyway, verse 1 says, let brotherly love continue. All he's saying is, you've already been practicing love all the way up to this point. Continue making, showing love to everybody. So that's what he's saying. If you read what he said before to now, he's saying just keep on showing love. And while you're showing that brother to love one another, do not forget to entertain strangers. For by doing so, by doing so, you have unwittingly entertained angels. Now let me throw this out there. I'm going to talk about the angel part in a minute. But the word entertain in the first part and the last part entertained is the same word for hospitality. It's exactly the same word. So if we're going to read it, let's read it in the original text, which would be, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this, some have shown hospitality to angels without even knowing it. Now, just in case somebody was talking about we got angels, the writer here in Hebrews is alluded to Genesis 18. Genesis 18. You can read that in your own time. Well, I, no, I ain't going to tell you anything. Read it on your own time. Genesis 18. So, that being said, let me be clear that this passage, the point is that now we should be expecting angels to literally come our way. That's not what he's saying. But rather he wants you to know, he's saying, you never know who you're entertaining. You never know who you're showing hospitality to because you don't know what blessings may come from how you treat that person. The hospitality that you showed to them when they came to worship. You never know how you may have made a person feel when they came to worship. So be careful how you treat or mistreat folk that come in. Matter of fact, I'll give you a true story and this, this makes sense to me. There is um, a story for, but that's a reason for no words. That's this brother that came for unknown reason to two particular congregations. And the man was definitely a sinner. There's no question he was a sinner. But he would visit these congregations. And in one congregation, um, he wasn't greeted very well by the first person he met. But the other people at the congregation treated him good. They treated him like pretty much he was normal or like he had, they had been there before. So even though he only expected the preacher to treat him right, he was greeted by other members as if this was not his first time ever coming. So occasionally this guy would go to another congregation and they treated him very well like he was a, uh, like he was a guest. And occasionally he would come back off and on and um, he wasn't given a stank eye, he wasn't mistreated. Folks just still treated him like his family. So we'll say two years later or two and a half years later, somewhere down the line this guy who obeyed the gospel. It was on a Wednesday night, 24th of, uh, 24th, 24th of April, 1996. 22 years plus later, he's a full-time minister at one of those places that he used to visit when he was a sinner. Please tell me y'all see that. Y'all know I'm talking about me, right? Yes. Understand that, matter of fact, do you think if y'all had mistreated me back then, I would be preaching here today? I, or the Lord said, no, all that saving, that's some stuff that you're just going to hold on to. If you had mistreated me, I just, as much as I love going to other visits and other places, I told you that's the places I'm not going back to. If they ask me to preach, I say, can I bring a lesson in the morning? Might we talk about hospitality? But I'm saying is, if I had ever felt like mistreated, when someone came and asked me to, to be the minister here, I would have said, no, oh, thank you. I would have been the sweetest person about it. I appreciate the offer, but they know where in the world. But because I felt like I was going to be at home because how I was treated when I wasn't even close to the Lord. I don't time I came close to the Lord when I drove past here and then that other church. <laughs> I don't mind saying I ain't always been a Christian. But what I'm saying is when it says don't, or I should say do you see how important it is not to forget to entertain or give hospitality to strangers. For doing so, you may, I'm not calling myself an angel, y'all see the point of the text is, you never know what blessings you might get later on down the line. Amen. So I feel like I'm a blessing here, so I, I, I take that personal. So I want to make sure when people come, they feel the same way I felt. I'm like, okay, let me come on back. And it's clear that when people come into the Lord's house, we should show them the love that you do against 
Because you may miss out on blessings because of how you treated someone. So therefore, when I came in, I can tell you how I viewed you when you viewed me. When I seen you looking up and down. <laughs> well, it wasn't all y'all, because a few of them. Sister Mado, she told on this. She said, yeah, I remember you. <laughs> okay, yeah, you should sit back. She told me where you should sit. So that I means she's one of the people that used to turn around. <laughs> yeah. But if she had been mean mugging me, I would have remembered her. Ah, so yeah, I remember people that did so. So remind you, how do people view you after they view you, yeah. viewing them? Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, because my head is saying right, okay. Now here's the flip side in the lesson show. The flip side of that, in how we show hospitality, is when you do show Hospitality, it makes sure you're, you're, you're not showing favoritism or showing discrimination with your hospitality. What you saying, Robin? I'm saying this. If you, if you, I'm, I'm going to give you my, I translate for James. You can turn that if you want to. James, second chapter, verse 1 through 4. I like to translate my own text. I see what people write, but I don't spend all this money, got these school loans. I'm going to translate my own Bible stuff too. But what I want you to see is you can be discriminatory or show favoritism to folk in your hospitality. I'm going to read it in how I wrote it, and it's going to should line up close with the King James verse and the New King James verse. My brothers and sisters, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. So if you read along with it, you'll see what I'm saying. Verse number two. For if anyone comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes. And there also come in a poor person in dirty clothes. And you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes. And you say, sit here in a good place. But you say to the poor person, you stand over there or you sit down at my feet. Have you not discriminated? Discriminated. Wow. Discriminated. Wow. Correction, we got it right. Among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts and motives. Amen. James, yes. second chapter, verse 1 and 4. So guess what? You can show favoritism in the church. Now you still treat people all right. I got a seat for you, but I want you to sit back in the corner. But somebody come in with fine Jerry, they, they look like something, they walk in and you let them sit in the front. Y'all know me, I don't care if the man come in, he can sit in the back like everybody else. Because you know he put his britches on like me now, there's something wrong with it. You one leg <laughs> at a time. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, I don't care who you are, you're the same at the foot of the cross just like me. I can't, and this person were working in the doctor's office, working, I've seen folk come in, I didn't know who they were. Oh, he on this, he on that. He's a patient of me. He don't want nothing there but his mouth while I'm doing what I'm doing while he's sitting there. Or her. Now, because of that, I go in places, oh, no, you know, hey, you know, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I own this. Okay. Can I get a discount? Let me do it right now. <laughs> what you talking about, folks? <laughs> I'll I show through it in a heartbeat. So, what I want you to understand is that it, it's, I need you to get in your spirit. James is talking to Christians. He's not talking to non-Christians, he's talking to Christians. And he's actually commanding Christians to stop doing something that they were already doing. Right. He's saying stop discriminating. He's saying, he wasn't trying to prevent discrimination. He's saying stop discriminating against certain people who come into your worship based on the, your, their outer appearance. Because you don't know who is coming where. But that young man, he doesn't wear a suit and tie. And if you looked at my son, you would never guess well, he ain't wearing a suit and tie for all. He must be just busy. He's wearing blue jeans. He ain't wearing a shirt. He ain't wearing a tie. That doesn't mean anything. Just like some people, when they see me in my speed clothes or me looking like a scrub, they see me in scrubs. You a nurse? Uh, and Yes, I am. But if you look at me, that's not what you would think. And then they come to church. You a preacher too? Yeah! <laughs> so don't let the outer appearance fool you. Because some people, they're judged you are because everybody put on just in case you know folk put on for Christ. You know the Bible said put on Christ that some folk put him on for Sunday and so the Sunday over they take him off and take him off <laughs> the next week. 
So, y'all understand. So, James is saying, stop discriminating the short of favoritism on certain people based on their appearance. So, which means for us today that we are not to treat everyone, oh, I'm sorry, we are to treat everyone who comes into worship service exactly the same way. So, if someone comes in with six kids, no man, you don't know where that man's working. But you made a judgment. Oh, look at that. Ain't no telling. Uh-huh. Four kids, was that six kids and five baby dads? You're making a judgment that you don't know anything. That some people that are running the business, hey, how you doing today? Who your peoples is? So they will treat you based on who your peoples is. Yeah. My peoples ain't got nothing to do with anything. Please tell me, you know, I'll turn that heat on. Okay. Let me go get some water. That's what I need. This good wine. Because I hear a humming, and it sure don't sound like an air conditioner. All right, man. <laughs> but here's the beauty. Hospitality says some folks are cold. Turn the heat on. I can suck it up and suck up some water. I'll be fine. But what I'm saying is, don't treat people or show hospitality to people based on who they are. Meaning, don't show special attention. That's what the text was te teaching. To those who dress or look a certain way, or those who are in line with what you believe in. Because there's some folks who may not believe the same way you do, but they show up. So are you going to treat them differently because of who they are, what faith belief they believe in? We're supposed to be showing them Jesus. Not your personal religious thought process. <laughs> But let them see Jesus because no one should be treated any good, any gooder, wow, any better, wow, that's horrible, or any worse based on their ethnicity, their gender, economic status, religious belief, or their outward appearance. Because it's not fair. So what I'm saying is we need to make everyone feel honored and as if their presence is appreciated. Now remember we're talking about folk that are coming into church. But what about your own brothers and sisters? What I'm trying to show you is that you can show partiality to your own brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, the command is in Romans 12, 13. Romans 12, 13 and verse 3 to 4, 9. Both of them give the command that brothers and sisters ought to have the attitude and the disposition to be hospitable to one another. Now I'm going to say that to say this means don't show favoritism to Jimmy, but then you show Brother Lindsay a little different type of um, a treatment of hospitality. Matter of fact, let me, let me say it this way. I should be nervous about saying it, but I'm going I'm to take the hit. Treat me with the same hospitality that you treat all your other brothers and sisters in Christ with. Think about what I'm just saying. Because there's some folk that I should be worried about telling you to treat me like you treat everybody else. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is don't treat me different because I'm the preacher. Treat me the same way because I'm your brother and sister in Christ. There's some people you don't fool with. Now remember now, we all family, but there's some family you just can't fool with. But you shouldn't mistreat them. You're still supposed to treat them with love. So if there's the lapons can make your hair, but you love Ida to death, hug him like you're hugging her. Just close your eyes. I mean, uh, I love you. Y'all see what I'm saying? Don't treat him differently because you have an issue or you just don't like something. You know, folks just don't like people for no reason. And you just say, why you don't like them? I don't know. I just don't like them. That don't make sense. It's a man on the moon. That's the nice I like my dad. On the world. Don't treat a guest and certain folk in the congregation with love and hospitality, but show certain uh, other brothers and sisters hatefulness and ill treatment. Meaning, if a visitor comes in and they see how you treat one person, they look at you and see how you treat Belford. Y'all see how he treat? They ain't treat the same. People watch you. And the Lord forbid, Mariah, if she see everything, you know where she got that power from, right? That's a superpower. Seeing everything. Walking around drinking sodas that ain't nobody ever heard of before. Y'all be missing Wednesday night. We have some Bible study on Wednesday night. This little piggy went to the market. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but have you ever considered the fact, and this is something I want you to take in your spirit, have you ever considered the fact that most people who leave a congregation and go to another congregation, it ain't because of doctrinal issues. Well, I should say most of the time, they leave because they felt mistreated by brothers and sisters in the church. 
when you know it's quiet when it's hitting home. <laughs> they feel like they were discriminated against. They, they feel like, well, in other words, they see how others were treated with favoritism. So in other words, if I had, you ever notice I don't treat everybody, I treat everybody the same? No words, that's like, oh, that's that's right, that's the preacher's running pop. Because I understand the mindset of people. So you won't see me hanging tight with certain people because I don't want to get that impression. I'm going to treat you all the same. I'm going to mistreat you. If you say the wrong thing, I'm going to be slick mouth to you too. That's how much love I have for you. I want you to feel like that. But understand that there's some people who have seen how you treat one person and then they turn around and, matter of fact, let somebody see it. Mm -hmm. This person, you, it's okay. You know, we understand, we, we got you. Same person do the same sin. Now you're treating them like the, the highest, but you push them away. Like, y'all see what I'm saying? And if you don't think it has happened, I'm telling you, it has. So there's some people who leave, not because of doctrine issues, because they feel mistreated and they haven't been treated well. Now, and that's the reason why I'm saying this is because I went to some folk who I've seen as like, where you been? I didn't even know you were done. Where you been? They felt like, matter of fact, one person, let me see what they told me. The person said, I left the faith because how they treated me and my wife one way and then treated someone else who did the same thing exactly in a different way. Somebody wanted something and they saw how somebody else got treated a certain way, but because they were friends with somebody who had power in the church, they let them get their way. So y'all see how favoritism easily is done? So, the man says, I went to the leadership and told them I didn't like how I was treated and how other people have been treated. So it says, when it, I brought it to their attention, Instead of that person saying, I'm sorry, I will do better, they basically turned around and told him, your belief and your thought process is in your head. And he said that one of the guys had nerve to tell him that, they, that he was wrong for accusing him of favoritism. And he needed to repent. Now, do y'all wait a minute? Hold on. So I said, you see, he said, I went to this brother and told him, I showed him favoritism and showed him how he did it. He told me I was wrong and I was in sin for accusing him. And he needs to repent. And he has not set foot in a church of Christ in a long, matter of fact, the last, the first time I seen him was when we were at Daleville Heights at their um, revival, their gospel meeting. That's the first time I had seen him. And he said, the only reason I'm coming because I said, I know there's some people who I love. And that's why he was there. So I want you to see how what we can do can make people in their own mind feel like it ain't worth me being there. And all I'm saying is if it happened 2,000 years ago when it's James time, you need to be mindful that it's still happening today. So we have to be careful on how we treat one another. Me and Debbie, we're nurses, so we're going to have certain conversations that we can have. We all be standing there and you haven't got a clue what we're talking about. Now I can try to break it down to you. But you'd be like, you know what, I'll come back. So it's not that I can't, but there's certain things that certain of us we the pond's like fish. He knows that he can talk fish and stuff with other people. Jimmy like playing his video game on his phone. <laughs> so if you don't play your video game on your phone, you can't, you know what I'm saying? There's certain things we all have in common. But we also have one thing in common, and that's our salvation in Christ. And we need to be mindful to encourage one another. So the most important thing is. Don't treat a person with hospitality based on how much money they put in the collection plate, uh, what status they hold outside the church or inside the church, and most importantly, against what their sin used to be or who their people is. Because who their people is is not them. Salvation is personal. So remember, Paul dealt with that in Galatians 16, and he said, therefore we have an opportunity. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all men. And he said something extra there. Especially, Especially to who? The household of faith. So you need to make sure that you take preference of your own brothers and sisters in Christ over your own family. Let me, let me make sure you understand this. When Jesus' family was standing outside the door, tell, about you, tell Jesus to come on out here. You understand? So in other words, he's not dismissing them. 
but your family, you're connected by blood. Am I right? That makes sense to anybody? There's a special blood that you have when you're in Christ Jesus. That blood is a little bit strong. You know, that blood is thicker than water. Yeah, it is. And that kind of blood is definitely thicker than water. So we have to be mindful that when you're in the family, treat family like family. Yeah, because I still mix with all and y'all still let me come back every week. So when folks come to the assembly, by your words, your facial expressions, your body language, your behavior, you're going to make folks believe and make them feel. We talking about brothers and sisters, non-Christians or Christians, embarrassed or calm, ignored, recognized, unwanted, wanted, welcome, unwelcome, humiliated, honored, or loved and hated. So you have to ask yourself, how do guests and your brothers and sisters in Christ actually view you? That's all I'm saying. So if you took the time and said, you know what, I'm going to go to Tim and I'm going to talk to Tim and say, Tim, I want you to give me a true assessment of how you think I am. Now be careful when you go to because you might get the answer. So I just gave you a warning. Don't go to Tim. <laughs> Y'all know who his mama that is. You know who his people is. I'm just being messy. I won't say that. <laughs> but I'm just saying is, have you ever stopped and took an assessment of yourself to see how you really appear to others? Mm -hmm. Not that you got to put on, but is your lifestyle in such a way folks don't want to fool with you? And they come and find out they walk in the church to see you. Oh, I know I'm in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So we're going to conclude the lesson by simply saying, if you haven't been walking worthy of your vocation, by showing hospitality, by showing hospitality to everyone, simply repent of that behavior. Just, just know that you need to treat about love. And there's some folks who have experienced such good hospitality that when they came, they made up in their mind to visit here more often or say, I'm going to make Southside my home. Y'all ever thought about that? That's a book. Uh, I'm missing my brother with the dreads in the back of the mom and the dad at work, at least it's free. So I'll go by and check up on it. But he, Wednesday night and Sunday. So what I'm saying is we have people who have stopped by and felt so much love when they came. Church, my church home now, it's Southside. Because they feel like they're family here. And they, 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 uh, they didn't come to visit only because of the fellowship. Man, you know how some folks only come for that reason. They're still coming. So that's a testament of who you are and how you have treated people. So we have to remember we treat them like family. But be careful with your words and just let them know you just like family. Because you know we got some friends who can say just you just like family. I'm gonna treat you like family. But technically, they ain't true family. We were talking about that blood earlier. So we know what makes you real family is blood. So I want to inform you, if you're someone here and you're just like family to us, God has made a way for you to be in the family. And when you're in the family, you get to enjoy those blessings and those benefits and promises that only the Father can give his children. And the only way that you can get in the family is through the blood of Jesus Christ. That blood that Jesus shed, he made a way so you can be in the family and you are part of the blood in the family. So which means if you're here and you're not a child of God, you believe that Jesus Christ died upon the cross for all your sins, was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. You confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you repent of your sins, you can obey the gospel by going being baptized for the remission of your sins and allow God to add you to the church. Therefore God then connects you to the blood and therefore you become blood family like everyone else. So you are here. And if you want to respond to the invitation, we do so as we stand and sing a verse of our encouragement song. There's a fountain.